I'm with Art Wolf at his gallery in Seattle, Washington. And if you don't know who Art is, shame on you, because to my mind, he is the, one of the preeminent photographers of our generation. And Art, it's a real pleasure being here. Thank this you, is, Michael. This is great. What a beautiful gallery. It's a nice space. How long have you been here? For about eight years. Mm, it's just absolutely lovely. And I, what I want to do is just start right off looking at images. And as we, we walk and talk, uh, that'll be an opportunity to find out more about you and your work and what you do and why you do it. So let's just go right to some Sure, things. why not? Lead on. All right, let's look, head on down this way. This first print art, to me, summarizes something about what you do because you're a landscape photographer, you're a nature photographer, and you are a person photographer. And that's a really interesting combination. Start by telling me a little bit about this. This was early in the morning on the outskirts of Kyoto in the Temple District. And I had set up, I had found this uh, location the night before. I thought it was beautiful because we're all used to, you know, paths in the forest and roads down a rural road. But this was like a footpath in this forest of bamboo. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, get up early, get the shot. It will be such a beautiful, quiet, serene scene. Right. So I'm in the middle of taking the picture and out of the corner of my eye, I see this motion. And I turn around and there's this huge group of people with umbrellas. It was misty in the morning. Mm -hmm. And before I could stop them, which was my original uh, thought, I just let them go. And as they're walking through, I thought, come on, take the picture. Yeah. Because it's a, a nice contrast between sharp focus and very impressionistic shots of color. And that's what made the shot. And that's not uncommon. Often the shots that you preconceive, you set up, something inadvertently will happen. And if you have the mind to mm -hmm. capture it, it often is that element, that noun in the sentence. And for me, that's what it was. That uh, They're almost levitating down this beautiful path. It's, it's the serendipity factor. It is. And uh, so often, I think photographers go out, uh, they have an image in mind, and if they stick to that, almost like a script, then it's going to be forced. If you just let the world unfold in front of you, whether it's the atmospherics or, or some happenstance, that's great. I love this image. It's just so soft. What so you just said is so true, though. With people that are open for the unexpected, those often are the best takes of the day. Mm -hmm. Let's move along to this right. next one. This one is one of your archetypal shots. And I know, I read somewhere, that you have over a million photographs in your archive. But I would say of those, there are maybe a dozen that are your, have your trademark stamp on them. And this certainly is one. What a wonderful image. Tell me a little bit about this. You know, it looks so peaceful. It looks so serene, and it looks like just that moment. And in fact, a lot of shots that I've taken over the years have been somewhat set up. And I'll tell you the story behind this. I saw this scene the night before I shot it. And I know that along uh, the Ganges in Benares, this ancient city along the Ganges, virtually every morning, for weeks on time, the sun rises through a, a veil of mist. Mm -hmm. And for about five seconds, it's a red orb. And then shortly thereafter, it becomes too hot to actually shoot in. So you really, it would be impossible, literally impossible, <laughs> to get a shot like this, mm -hmm. just like that. Because it's F-22, it's a very long exposure. I had to have this pilgrim, which is an actual pilgrim on the Ganges. Right. Uh, I pulled the boat up into the mud so they would be very static. And through an interpreter, I asked that they remain absolutely stone silent mm -hmm. in movement mm -hmm. so that I could get a very sharp shot. But it has to be planned. It had to be that five sure. second window to get the shot. I used a two-stop, graduated neutral density filter over mm -hmm. along the horizon. I had that person very stable. I had uh, the focus point right one-third in there. I did it by the numbers, but it's uh, that moment of serenity, and that implies uh, a bigger story about coming to the Ganges, crossing this great spiritual river. You know, for the Hindu faith, the Ganges represents the gods because it originates in the nearby Himalayas. So this pilgrim was there and actually camping on the distant shore. You know, one of the things that I've always admired about your work is that you are honest about your shots. If it's a setup, 
You say it was yeah. a setup, and there's nothing wrong with that. This is a real person in a real situation. It's not a stage set. Right. This is the real world, right. but you put the pieces together. And I also try and do that, and that's one of the things, I don't know whether I, uh, I do it because I know that you've been doing it, or it's a coincidence, but I hate it when photographers do shots that are setups and then pretend that, oh yeah, I just happened to be there. No, you know, and sometimes these wonderful well, images have to be created. Absolutely, and you know what? It's just capitalizing on the elements. Everything in this shot are real. This is mm -hmm. not a hired actor. Right. Uh, but you know what? It's why should photography be any different than painting, sculpturing? You know, we're using the elements of art. I purely look at photography, especially from the way I see things. I look at it as an art form. And so I'm using the tools at my trade, and if I need to orchestrate this a little bit to get a better shot, it's all about the final image and whether it implies or conveys a sense that I'm trying to convey to people, which is quiet meditation. The fact you can't see the person's face is not an accident. Mm -hmm. By not showing the face, it allows people to really enter the shot as if they're right over the shoulder of this person, and it, it, it's capturing a moment that uh, connects with people on multiple levels. Now, 90% of what I shoot is on the fly. You know, cultures, candidly, or wildlife as they're doing their things. But 10% of what I photograph is looking at the elements and how can I make it better? And this is certainly one of those occasions. Let's move along okay. and let's look at something that is very much a setup not in the real world, but something that you have created. Because as you say, you are an artist first. Okay. And, and, and I think the other thing I want to mention is a little later on, what I want to do is I want to sit down and talk about the fact that you're not a techie. No, you know, not at all. You're an artist slash photographer slash artist, however you want to phrase that, uh, and that you have uh, people that uh, work with you, for you, uh, who do your printing and your matting and, and all the rest of it, uh, but that for you, the camera is almost uh, secondary. It's about image creation, it, not absolutely. about using gear. That's right. Yeah, how important is that? So okay, let's, let's do this. Let's move along. All right. So this is what... I think a lot of people would consider a setup shot, mm -hmm. but it's... Uh, you didn't happen to just float over this moment. <laughs> well, you know, most of the situations is I see the elements. All the elements were right here. And in fact, the elements meaning all these women and this design on this courtyard out there in the desert, a small town in Rajasthan. And I just saw that design on this uh, courtyard and all these wonderful women wearing their toe jewelry and these beautiful colored you know, toenails. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool to combine those two elements and make something of an abstract shot? Lovely. Lovely. So what I did was I just had all these women that were kind of sitting around this courtyard talking gather up and I just basically sat them around this so that their feet came right up against this, what they call, uh, I would call a medallion. It's actually, if you live in a desert environment, it stands to reason that you're gonna wear bright colors, you're gonna adorn your buildings, because everything else is drab. And so in Rajasthan, in the spring, all the buildings, the courtyards, you may have seen this yourself, are, have these wonderful abstract designs. Mm -hmm. And so I had them sit around it, and then I just simply leaned over with a wide angle and shot straight down. And at the end of all of this, then I asked our interpreter, what are they talking about? Because they hardly missed my uh, actually intruding in their lives. They just kept talking and talking and talking. And I asked the interpreter, are they talking about like world affairs? What are they talking about? <laughs> Oh, they're talking about how lazy their men are, that the men will refuse to go out and get the goats at in the end of the day, and that they also are expected to get the goats and cook the dinner. So they were complaining about their men, which is like I was anywhere you say, go. And, and how is that different <laughs> than our society? <laughs> exactly. And you know, that's a greater uh, metaphor for what I try to do. What I try to do in many of my photos, and in fact some of the books, and the TV show I do, is show the commonality of humans w worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, the show that they're not that different in what they're concerned about, how they live their lives, and they uh, show the commonality and therefore the fact that the earth is a pretty small place. Oh, yeah. And we ought that, to be getting along. little blue marble. Yeah. But, yeah, so I love to knit stories. Well, there's a shot over here which I think says it all. Let's go look at okay, that. Okay, let's look at that. 
Oh, what a lovely montage. This is so great. How many shots? Two, four, six, seven by two, four, six, eight, seven, 56. Well, you know, what I was saying about the other image is true here. It shows how humans worldwide are so similar in, in this case, in how they adorn themselves. Mm. And this, these are uh, photos excerpted from a book I did called Tribes which was nothing more than a celebration of primitive cultures around the world, technologically primitive cultures, and how they adorn themselves with leaves and beetles and pigment from berries or clays right. from the bank of a river. And it's all around the world, from it's Africa to South so America. So beautiful. What, I, what I'm looking at, what's capturing me are the eyes. Yeah. And well, in fact, that was an intentional take on this entire book because I wanted them to stare straight into my yeah. camera and therefore into the viewers, your eyes. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the result is that you feel the tension. At the moment I took the picture, the people mm -hmm. that look at that shot of those very intense eyes oh, there's a fills that moment. Yeah, communication. And, uh, you know, it it's really was a celebration of how creative these cultures are. I'm just knocked out at your ability to not only photograph uh, people, but nature. It's, it, it's really something that I don't see that many photographers who are adept at both sides. So now, let's go look at okay. a place that I have a particular love for, and that's Wangshan, the Yellow Mountains in China. All right, let's go look at that. Yeah, this one uh, particularly uh, caught my eye. Uh, actually, both of these, let's look at them one after the other. Because uh, I remember where they were shot from. What a <laughs> wonderful place. And, and the thing that I said to you before as we did our initial walkthrough on the gallery is I'd been, I went to Hong Kong and to China a number of times, uh, not for photography though, on, on various business missions. And I went to art galleries and I would see traditional Chinese painting and I would see these and I'd say, this, a is, magical landscape. this is magical, yeah. where can this be if it exists at all? And then when I went there and I walked around at dawn of seeing the mists rising, I went, this is a real place, it's incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. It's this 3,000 foot mo mountain that rises out of, as you know, out of eastern China. Mm -hmm. And it's surrounded by swirling mist from the lowlands. It's got these jagged granite or uh, hard rock pinnacles. And then it's got all these beautiful twisted pine trees. Mm -hmm. So yeah, atmospheric conditions, lay of the land. It is truly walking through a magical landscape. Now, these are black and white. And you're not noted for your black and white work. You're That's primarily right. a color photographer. So tell me a little bit about, you know, obviously you did this because this is the way it looks. I mean, the mists are uh, transparent and uh, I, I did a little bit of color there, but most of my prints are also black and white. Well, you know, as I'm maturing as a person and a photographer, I'm never satisfied just staying where I was. I'm always evolving the subject matter, but also how I'm capturing the subject matter. And I've always, you know, my background's painting. And for six years, I was at a fine art school, the University of Washington here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I love presenting my work as nicely and as professionally and cleanly as possible. I love the look of black and white. And certainly many of my colleagues have been shooting black and white for their entire careers. I've looked at it somewhat enviously and mm -hmm. thought, you know, someday I'm going to pursue that as well as a lineage in my work. And so I discovered Huan Shan on my way back from Mount Everest expedition in 1984. And back in 84, it was not really discovered even by the Chinese. You they, know, there were... They, a, they, they had the hotels up there. They had they? a few really rustic hotels. Oh, okay. And the cable car? Uh, they didn't have the cable car. How so uh, 3,000 foot steps, you know, all day long getting up there with a the backpack. I went there two I years went ago. There with the cable car. Was oh, there. and it's oh, and I would <laughs> gladly get on that right. cable car. But at any rate, you know, black and white seems appropriate because it's a very complex landscape. By rendering it into black and white, you take a little bit of that complexity away, and you mm -hmm. play with the strengths, the drama of the mist. And I also went so far as to have a chop I that noticed, says yeah. Huan Shan and Art Wolf on it. Okay. And I just look, like the look, you know, very much what I photograph. And certainly living in Seattle, we have a 
really strong Asian aesthetic. Mm -hmm. A lot of Japanese people live here, a lot of Chinese, Vietnamese. I eat the food, I live that way at my home, I've got a Japanese garden. So everything I photographed has a little bit of that aesthetic. Certainly, Huan Shan yeah. allows me to uh, really showcase that. Let's look at this next one, which I think is the strongest of your series. And I know exactly where you were standing. I think I have a very similar shot. Frankly, yours is better, <laughs> but nevertheless. <Thank> you. <laughs> no, nevertheless. Uh, by the way, um, issue number 20 of the Luminous Landscape Video Journal has a segment on our trip to China and uh, Wang Shao and um, the Li River. And um, so I'm looking forward to seeing it because it's just about to Fantastic. be published as we're filming this. So, um, ah, these are big trees. Yeah. This, this is what's so deceptive. These aren't little bonsais. I know. <laughs> you know they in look fact, like it, but you know, not. It's breathtaking. And one of the reasons I love this place, and I'm sure you would agree, is one second, it's completely veiled in mist. You can't see a thing. And then it just rises and reveals. Rises and reveals. It's very theatrical. I like this shot as this is my favorite, too, because the vertical sweep of mm -hmm. these mountains and they're, you know, it's a great study of black and white positive and negative space because each land formation is somewhat isolated by the mist. And it, it's like a landscape nowhere else on earth. I mean, as beautiful as your Canadian Rockies are, or the <laughs> Himalayas are, or the Andes, there's nothing quite like Huan Shan. I mean, it's just this magical, very foreign environment. And the fact that you can take a cable car up there you can stay overnight. You can walk on these paths. Now, you have to kind of let go of the fact that there may be 10,000 Chinese all over you. Oh, the day we were there, you. I think there were about a billion. And <laughs> it's, it, yeah, so you, you have, it's, it's a great study for a photographer yeah. to focus and concentrate and eliminate all of that because what you see where they're not is this magical yeah. world. There may be, there may be, 20 people behind you yelling at their kids and you know, various nonsense going on, even at dawn, as you know. We went out the first morning we were there, and we went out at dawn, and we thought, oh, this is so beautiful and tranquil. And what we discovered is that it appears, and I may get this wrong, but it appears that the Chinese have a thing for hearing their echoes because everyone was standing around yelling at 5 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. to hear their echoes through the mountains. And Absolutely. Like, Could we have a little quiet, please? This is whatever happened to this, you know, Asian serenity you know, that we, that we want to hear and, and, and see. It's like they're greeting the sunrise. Yeah. I think they're greeting. I'm not Maybe. quite sure whether know. they yell at sunset or not, but <laughs> yeah. It, they, they sure do at sunrise. At but, sunrise. you know, this is one of the few sacred places in China. There's a couple other mountains. And this is like going to Mecca for a Chinese to go yeah. to the sacred mountain. It's maybe once in a lifetime. Yeah. No, it's a wonderful experience no matter what. Let's go down here because there's a shot that we were at shooting together just a few days ago. Okay. This is at Second Beach uh, on the coast at Olympic National Park. And one of the reasons that I'm here is, and I'm saying this for the audience's sake rather than, uh, than yours, because you were there, is we were shooting together for a few days. And um, this was a great location. Um, different time of year, because I don't think the sun was exactly there. That's exactly right. This is probably shot during the month of uh, early April, and we were there in mid-May, and yeah. that sun was just going down through that gap. Yeah, exactly. And I've, I've seen this shot. Uh, when did you do it? What year? Well, this was actually just last year. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I saw you, it, it, it appeared somewhere in a You know, everybody and their brother from the West Coast has been on <laughs> this beach. Maybe I'm thinking of someone else's shot. But, you know, it's a famous <laughs> beach, and I think it's because of the lay of the land. You've got yeah. these, what we call sea stacks, and they're nothing more than what was the main continent, but over millions of years it's eroded into an island as the lands move back. But what's unique about these land formations, and you have the 12 apostles in Australia, and you get the whole sea stacks along the California coast, but we have trees on ours. And often there's eagles nesting on those trees, but it's a great thing to have the ocean, little bits of uh, land formations, interesting foregrounds, the sounds, the smells, it's all there, and it's my backyard. Yeah. And it's probably why I'm a photographer today, because we have such beautiful, 
natural scenery everywhere you look in Washington. Oh, it's such a beautiful state. This is actually the first time I've been to Olympic National Park, uh, but it won't be the last. Although I have to say, after five days of shooting in Olympic, I am so OD'd on green. <laughs> shooting it's in the rainforest, true. it's like, don't show me any, your exit sign over there is green. And it's like, it's like no, I want a red exit sign. You know, I absolutely <laughs> agree. I mean, there's so much you can do with various levels of green. It's like, you know, Eskimos have, what, 100 words to talk about snow. Mm -hmm. We have probably 35 different greens out there in the Olympic rainforest. In October, the vine maples go yellow, the broad leaves start turning a beautiful rust color, and that's when you get that dimension mm. of color. Yep. But invite me back. I'll have you out there. <laughs> Let's go look at two of your images, which again are part of your legacy, okay. uh, in which so many people identify with you. And I think both of them have interesting discussions. So I think one of them is in your office. In okay, let's do it. This is the famous, or maybe infamous, zebra shot. And it was on the cover of your migrations book. What year? Boy, I think that was 1990 uh, or 1986. You know, right. I, I forget. You've done 60 books. I'm always looking forward. <laughs> I never look backwards. Okay. Now, the controversy or controversy uh, around this was um, there was some cloning. Right. There's and more stories about this photo than the rest of my archive. Okay, so give us, give us. This photo was created for a book called Migrations. Now, had we called it Wallpaper, nobody would have complained. <laughs> uh, they also wouldn't have bought it. That's right. This was a book uh, that was inspired by the work of M.C. Escher, you know, the Dutch illustrator sure. that took animal motifs and created this beautiful, whimsical you know, positive and negative space, and I loved his work. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I could ever pay homage to this artist through the photographic medium, I would try. And that's what I was trying to do here. And it was basically swarms of birds, you know, schools of fish, herds of animals, patterns, you yep. know, where you have just this mass of animals. And there were a hundred photos in this book. This was the cover of the book. And for the first book, in fact, one of the only uh, works that we ever incorporated digital illustration, we called it digi digital illustration for want of a better term. Mm -hmm. Back then, this was really in the beginning of digital sure. and what you could do. And so basically, I heard all sorts of complaints about it. This had been digitally uh, manipulated, and the word manipulation. This is around the time of uh, the National Geographic cover where they moved one of the pyramids. Years and, after yeah. that, oh, was actually. It after yeah, that? Okay. but it was still, that was still uh, really huge on them. You know, they were still reeling from that experience. Mm -hmm. We thought, we, we didn't enter this, uh, this world naively. We, we talked around with the editors in my office, how do we introduce this? Do we hide it or do we just boldly embrace it and say this is what it is? And uh, so we thought, okay, put it in the introduction. This book contains digital illustrations because of the connection with the artist MC Escher. Sure. So what we did was basically, I took this uh, shot of a herd of uh, zebra that were backed up along the Mara River and the herd itself actually extended way beyond this. There were several thousand animals <laughs> in the herd. And I think I've you know, counted bits and pieces of about 60 animals. So many people complained we created false numbers, that these were highly endangered animals and we were telling a false story, none of which was nonsense, true. Nonsense, nonsense. And then some editors, like US News and World Report, claimed that we took one animal and we simply replicated <laughs> one animal 60 <laughs> times to make a herd, which we never did. Right. And I was in Antarctica when they were writing this article and they wouldn't wait for an interview with me. They just created what they believed happened. Mm -hmm. But what really happened is we took an area where there, you could see the definition of the edge of the herd. There was beige grass. Right. And we took animals from behind the herd mm -hmm. and we dropped them in. Sure. And uh, we created, uh, we continued the pattern. Mm -hmm. And the idea being is when you don't show the very edges of a herd, it creates the illusion and it goes on forever. It becomes sure. more abstract, which is what our tent was intent was. This book became a lightning rod because people condemned this for using this technology in quotes unquote a nature book. Uh, designers and uh, you know graphic artists throughout the world 
gave us credit for us, and we, in fact, got awards for the book. Nature purists condemned us. And so, you know, uh, I, it was talked about, you know, and people at the time said, you know, sooner or later, people are going to forget the controversy. They're going to remember the book. Well, whether that's I, true I or not. I remember the controversy. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do too, because yeah. I learned that journalism was not necessarily accurate. Mm -hmm. They wrote about their own personal experience. Whether they interviewed me or not, they wrote about it, and yeah. most times it was inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, some of the people complained that they would want a drawn out illustration of what was done so they could look at it. And it's this, art. It wasn't art. A, <laughs> it wasn't a how to book. No, it was an art right. book. Yeah. No. But anyway, that's bottom what we did. line. Lovely image. Thank you. Now, thank you. Another controversial topic, not necessarily one related to you, but the issue of photographing captive animals. Okay, let's so go, let's on, go to that on to another one. All right. Wow, those eyes. Piercing. Are they great? Piercing. Well, you know, this is, uh, was for a book called In the Presence of Wolves. And 90% of what I photographed was in the wilds of Alaska and Canada, and it was great. But I also started working within some institutes, institutions that study wolf behavior. And in Nova Scotia, there's this very large enclosure, enclosure where biologists study the dominant male and how he interacts with other members of the pack. And I heard about this and I asked if I could come back and photograph and they said, sure. These wolves are pretty elusive and very wary of people. So I stayed in a blind to get these shots and it was beautiful, the snow was blowing. Mm. But they knew I was there, but they couldn't see me. Right. You know, they could it, smell you though. They could <laughs> smell me and they could sense. Yeah. But it was great to work here simply because uh, you could just see the behavior between the dominant male, the alpha male, and the rest of the pack. And just that combination of blowing snow mm -hmm. and the way those eyes are just penetrating. I love the shot. Uh, got some beautiful shots it's, in the it's wild. It's the essence of wolfness. It is. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, well, I would never photograph in, in captivity animals. But, you know, if you make a living from this, uh, you, there's a side of you that's got to be somewhat pragmatic. Mm -hmm. You know, 99% of what I photograph is in the wild. But yes, portraits of a jaguar will never be in the wild. Portraits of a Siberian tiger would never be in the wild. And for certain editorial purposes, it's nice to have those in your mm -hmm. files. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people now condemn captive animals, but there's been a long history with Hollywood, with captive animals that are performing for Hollywood. Uh, if they're humanely treated, and in this case, you know, this is a really wild enclosure that's, you know, probably uh, uh, two kilometers by five kilometers, so there's a lot of room to run around. And you could argue that there's a reason to study their behavior so we know how much land is necessary. Right. It's part of, part of the whole process of, of conservation right. is understanding behavior. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not hardly a spokesman for captive animals, but I've shot at zoos. Okay. Yeah. I've shot books called Primates of the World, which is probably 50% captive. I've mm -hmm. shot Wildcats of the World, which if you try to shoot wild cats, all 35 different species, that would be a life <laughs> long work that you would still not get sure. photographically. So, you know, there's a pragmatic side of, of me course. too. Now, speaking of books, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I believe I read somewhere that you've published over 60 books and around in the little sort of kiosk area, um, there are some of those books, maybe all of them. Can we go have a look? Sure, let's take a look at those. Okay. This appears to be, what, about 20, 30 different titles? These are your current titles, yes. right? Yes, yes. What's your favorite? Well, you know, there's the migration ones, but yeah. I love this one. This one was a more recent one. It was right. fun. It was called Vanishing Act. It was about camouflage in nature. Right. And it was a, a great endeavor. I learned a lot along the way because you know very well that most of us wildlife photographers want to make the animal so dominant, right? And this was all about hiding the animal before you. And as I would travel around North America talking about this book, the audience would start to squirm and they would start to get animated and they would say, I see it, I see it. And they wanted to demonstrate, obviously, right. that they were better than the people sitting next to them because they could find the animal first. But it was a fun book to work oh, on. Oh, I can imagine. 
That, you know, oh, that's so great. Wow, does that show you the camouflage? And there's work? two in here. Oh, is there a missing yeah, one? Oh, so, I missed that one. Right. Well, in fact, <laughs> missing it was the entire endeavor because I would put you know, subjects close to white trees sure. or distracting elements, or I would put them off in the corner and everything was in focus, so therefore there was no visual clue yeah, that, yeah. what was in focus. So it was, it was a great book to work on. Very it got cool. me all very around. Very cool. Uh, the one that I have at home that I keep handy, because I love looking at it, is this guy here. I love Edge this. Edge of the Earth, Corner, corner of, of the, the Sky. sky. Yeah. Which was a translation from Ultima Thule, which was an old Greek expression that implied the edges of the known regions. And in the time of the ancient Greeks, that was Greenland. So ultimate Thule, I meant to say. So a million photographs. Maybe. 60, 60 books. Yeah. What do you do in your spare time? I garden. <laughs> I actually have a garden that's very reminiscent of Huan Shan because right. I was so enamored of that place that you also love mm -hmm. that I, I came back. And over the last 25 years, I've brought in 100 tons of granite. I've brought in 100-year-old black pine trees from Japan. It's covered wow. in mosses, waterfalls, and it's just pure zen, and it surrounds my house. So everywhere I look, there's nature, and it reminds me. And in my house, I collect all sorts of baskets and carvings, inexpensive ones, but beautiful ones from around the world. Can we, so, can we go there? I would love to take right, you there. Let's do that before we have to leave. Why not? All it's right, five minutes away. Great. All right. But you know, great. the whole point of how I live and what I've done around my house is to show an integration. My lifestyle is seven days a week, 30 years in a row. And I love it because it's exactly what I breathe and eat and mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. And so I never look at photography as a nine to five job. It's no. life. It's, it's life. It's and passion. It's total integrated with the way I live. And yeah. you'll see that. Now, the one thing that I see over the corner of my eye, and I have to say, I cheated. You didn't want me to show it, but I put it here. Oh, yeah. And that is, um, well, it's not an Emmy. What's it called? A, a telly? A telly. And this is, we won five of these for last year's TV series. Which is my lead-in to the TV series. Absolutely. So tell, tell us about the series and where it came from, what's the story? Well, the inspiration of uh, Travels the Edge is, I, I think you're the same way. I mean, I know you're the same way. Uh, Luminous Landscapes about dispensing information. And what I do for taking pictures is I'm showing my audience something that they may not have seen quite that way. I love the pure educational component mm -hmm. of photography. The TV show is just an extension of that. Right. But in the field, it's in Ethiopia, it's in the Sahara, it's in the Himalayas, Antarctica, the polar regions, Mongolia, all yeah. places that imply the edge. And mm -hmm. I've taken my audiences to places that I've loved and discovered over the years. Now you have two 13 episode series. So yes. there are a total 26 of shows. 26 one hour programs. Half hour half shows. Half 26 hour half hour shows. Now I'm going to put in a plug because uh, as we've been spending this week together, we've been talking about getting this material out to a wider audience. Yes. And this has been shown on selected stations in the US on PBS. Yes. Uh, but what we're going to be doing, and it may, by the time this appears, uh, this may be a fait accompli, uh, we're going to make these available for download inexpensively on the Luminous Landscape website. This is exciting. This show, has won all those awards, as I said, but it's been picked up by 85% of all the PBS American Public TV stations, but they're all independent and they run them at different times yeah. of the day. It's been frustrating for me yeah. living in Canada because uh, no one in Canada broadcast it and the local station in Buffalo, New York didn't pick it up. So I'm looking forward, I noticed your assistant has put together a little care package yes. of, of DVDs, and I'm looking forward on the plane, on the flight back to Toronto, I'm going to start watching these on my laptop. So this is, this is going to be fun. What I'd like to do now is, let's go find a comfortable spot to sit down. Okay. And I want to talk to you not so much about um, your, uh, the, the business side, which are books and print sales and DVDs and uh, TV programs and not about specific images, but let's talk about the art of photography. Okay. Lead on. All right. I had koi. Two, mm -hmm. year, two batches of beautiful koi and river otters ate them, so I 
<laughs> yeah, river otters. What, they climbed up? They came up from the water. Wow. So this is where one of my book's cover was uh, photographed, the uh, on Puget Sound. So I photographed it. I'm trying to learn how to bonsai. I have to learn that. I did this two years ago, oh. which is kind of combining elements from all the rock panels I've photographed over the years. Mm -hmm. So that got me That's actually exciting. started. That's yeah, exciting. this is the first painting, and that led to doing the nude work with doing the backdrops. It was like mm -hmm. I was too nervous to start picking up a, a brush after so many years. So I did this one, and then it gave me the encouragement to move on. I have to uh, work on the actual presentation because they're so well cam camouflaged, you really have to look. <laughs> yeah, you really do. But it's pretty amazing that oh, there's no, actually. Oh, that's so exciting. Oh, that is so much fun. And to have it on large format. Yeah. But what I was saying at the gallery, as you look out any window, you're either looking at the water, mm -hmm. the garden, or trees. Right, and you have your own art. I have my own which art. Which integrates yeah. everything. My favorite room in the house oh, is this. Yeah. And this house is open, but you know, humans kind of like a yeah. little cozy yeah. spot, right? Yeah. Mm. Incredible. This is the kind of stuff I aspire to is absolutely natural, highly graphic. That, that's what turns my crank. And you know, uh, when I, I show this uh, photo in my lectures and I show uh, the work of Jackson Pollock or a Mark Toby and how they rely on the abstract and lines and chaos, but there's organized chaos. Yeah. And it's a fairly simple shot. Yeah. And, but it, I, I'm always showing context, you know, how I'm inspired by the works of Picasso and Manet and Monet and Seurat, and then I show the connections, Edward Hopper. And so I drive, I arrive at my inspiration from painters, not so much photographers. But right. everybody has an inspiring artist in their life. People sometimes ask me, where, what should I see, where should I go, what should I study to improve my photography? And I say, when you travel, go to museums and art galleries. Yeah. Look at paintings. Exactly. I, I say the same thing. I, I tell people, well, take classes from other photographers, but also do drawing classes, painting classes, because it's ultimately about composition, yep. use of light, refining the eye and the intellect. Well, and in fact, everything comes let's go that. sit down, because that's exactly what I want to talk about. Okay, let's go have a sit down, talk about photography, my favorite subject. Art, thank you so much for inviting me to your home. Uh, the uh, artwork from your travels all over the world, the Japanese garden, the view out, out over Puget Sound. It's perfect. Isn't oh, it? <laughs> can I move in? <laughs> this is so great. Um, we've talked about uh, some of your images. We've talked about your books, your gallery. Uh, I think what's uh, worth noting is you're not a techie. You're not a technical photographer. To you, the camera is just simply the tool for creating your images. Uh, you don't do your own printing. You don't do your own uh, digital darkroom work. Uh, you're I do out a shooting. a little bit now. OK, a bit? All right. Well, OK. Sorry, I didn't mean to disparage that. Uh, but what you're about in the current vernacular, uh, Art Wolf is about image making. Absolutely. Uh, so, and I know you have a tour coming up. And, you know, I'm concentrating on really what many of my colleagues aren't choosing to teach, which is finding, capturing, and exacting the most emotional impact out of any given situation. And I feel comfortable doing that. I'm the classic left hand, right brain person who is technologically challenged, but uh, composition and the aesthetic comes a little more naturally for me than many people, and that's why I teach. Yeah. Talking about the aesthetic of photography, there are so many different schools that have uh, arisen and fallen over the years, uh, from the mid-1800s right through to now, 150 plus years. We've gone through uh, pictorialism and uh, then the introduction of color and the reaction against color and now digital and uh, technology has always played a role in photography because we do use machines to produce our art. Um, give me a sense of your take on the question of style 
and where uh, so many people say, how do I develop a style? And I say, you don't consciously develop a style. A style comes from the work that you do. And one day you, woke up, you wake up and say, oh, I guess I'm kind of doing this kind of stuff. And then that changes over time as yeah, well. Yeah, and I, really, I think that's maybe the hardest thing to define for me because I am uh, totally engaged in many different concepts, different styles, so to speak, from black and white to color, from aerial work to abstract to the literal landscape and wildlife and urban cultures. But if I was to boil it down, I think whatever I'm tackling, I try to do it in a very clear, solid way. I think that what I see in your work, if anything, is a very strong sense of geometry. There's, uh, there are patterns and symmetries, uh, and the symmetries are almost a style in themselves. Yeah. Uh, to the extent that there is an art wolf look, uh, regardless of whether, I know we were talking about one of your images that you have on the upstairs staircase, which are the snow-covered trees, and it was, a, 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 I guess, a 617 wide aspect ratio shot, um, uh, or the, the zebras. Again, repeating patterns, symmetry. You know, I, I draw from what I call uh, the elements of design, which is shape, pattern, texture, and line. Those graphic elements are the skeleton from which 99% of what I shoot are involved. And I think that um, the solidness of looking at positive and negative space, uh, the intentionalness of the way I align the lines within my compositions, they're all there, but people may not see them. But there's, one, there's a reason that I think uh, one makes a name for themselves. And I often use tripods, and I, I really think about what's, you know, within the frame of my uh, composition. You know, I, I don't random, randomly shoot. I shoot uh, with a lot of thought to the lines, the leading lines, and the elements of design. And that's true whether it's wildlife or urban cultures or total abstracts. Now that's once you're there. Uh, this week in the three or four days that we were shooting together, and, and this was just a, a small group of friends who went out and uh, did some shooting in Olympic National, for, uh, National Park, just for the fun of it. Just for the fun of just it. Just for the fun of it. This was not with book projects in mind. This was just to do some photography, drink some wine, tell some silly jokes, and uh, have a good time. And now, a, a common shared experience by successful people. Exactly, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was. Um, but this raises, to my mind, the question of uh, clearly you do projects, but also clearly you're a very passionate photographer and very involved in uh, photography is your life. It's complete. And so this week we went out and just did photography for fun. Do you still do photography for fun? I have never stopped. I, uh, there has never been... I think. I mean, there's the drudgery of international travel. There's the stress of trying to make a living and supporting uh, a staff. But ultimately, I have never not had fun. I think when I photograph, everything else is secondary to the experience of taking pictures. And I've always looked at it just that way. I'm having a ball, whether I'm at 114 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in India two weeks ago, surrounded by millions of people total stress, the minute I'm clicking, I'm having a ball. And I'm not just making that up for a great sound bite. I'm totally having a great time all the time when I'm taking pictures. I take pictures to relax. I take pictures for my enjoyment. The fact that I make a living from it bonus. I mean, is a total <laughs> bonus. When I'm in the office, that's work. Mm -hmm. When I'm getting to the location, that's work. When I'm taking pictures, it is like charging in a battery. I think you actually know exactly what I'm talking about. I know exactly about. what it's, you're talking it's great about. Fun. So I, it's, it's, I've been uh, blessed. It's the juice that keeps the bunny going. <laughs> and all the books that I've ever worked on are books I proposed. They're subjects I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and people have allowed me to do them. So what's next for Art Wolf? Well, you know, I'm uh, working on a series of theatrical nudes, black and white, limited edition prints. It's 
completely different than anything you would associate with me. And that is, in fact, part of the journey and the fun of what I do. I love to entertain, but I always love challenging people to look at a subject in a slightly different way. And that comes directly from my background in painting and the art world where my instructors would always challenge me not to paint the way I've done before, but to try new things. And I've always tried new things. And, you know, my father's 92 years old. I'm taking him out to dinner tomorrow night for his 92nd birthday. He's working every day. I hope I drop in the field, in the forest, <laughs> with a camera in my hand. In other words, go with your boots on. Literally, there, there as is well no, as figuratively. There is no retirement in my future, <laughs> nor would I ever hope that. And I think uh, artists, writers, sculptors, we're all artists. No matter what the discipline, writers die with a pen in their hand. Sculptors are dying sculpting, usually longer in life than most people. So I think the, the magic uh, that successful people have learned is to live the passion, to find an occupation that allows their passion, and keep doing it. Stay engaged. Absolutely. Art, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's been my pleasure as well, and I can't wait till the next time we get out in the well, field. Or next week in Toronto. When We're going to be in Toronto to teach. next week. This is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. I hope so. Thanks, Art. Thank you.